Good afternoon and welcome to today's premium account short form market update for the 26th of March. Any individual reading or listening should discuss with our financial planner or advisor the merits of any recommendation offer presented in this material for their own specific circumstances and realise that not all investments are appropriate for every individual. Presented today, myself, Leon Hine, current Managing Director of Investor Signals. Format for today's presentation, a quick look at the macro update driving portfolio allocations. We look at the earnings review F year 15. We conclude with the the recent transactions and a short-term market outlook. The Investor Signals Premium Account Service is based around a model portfolio of ASX Top 50 stocks. We use call options to enhance portfolio returns and we focus around effective ownership of assets around ex-dividend dates. If you'd like to know more information, please contact Leon at investorsignals.com. Moving straight into a graph of the Dow Jones, our macro view is that equity markets are likely to consolidate and move sideways and synchronise global GDP growth largely as a result of an improving Eurozone should deliver a better environment for share price advancements towards the back half of this year. The US share market is essentially pricing in about 8 to 10 percent earnings growth already on a 12 month forecast. The XJO, similar numbers, we're looking for around 8 percent earnings growth. Our market's trading 15 times earnings on just over a 4 percent dividend yield. I think probably the range is maybe 5600 down to 5200 over the course of this year and we're likely to largely get a consolidation pattern in our market as well. Moving straight into the stocks that I want to cover today and I thought I'd just uh, to break it up, uh, present the portfolio in a slot. Normally we would roll through the top 50 stocks. Today I'm just going to look at it from a sector standpoint and first of all let's take a look at the property stocks that sit within our model portfolio. So Lendlease, we've been buyers and Lendlease at lower levels. We're most recently strong purchases of it around the 1050, 1070 level and up here at around $12.00. I still think the stock represents reasonable value, could trade as high as 12.50 before it runs into resistance at around a 3.5% dividend yield trading at around, uh, at around 12 times forward earnings. The stock is good value and I think where we start to see further uh, upside potential in Lendlease over the next two to three years is I think the company can deliver above trend growth somewhere in the order of 8 to 12 percent earnings per share growth. The other property name that we like is Stocklands. It pays its dividend coming up in June. Uh, we've seen Stocklands acquire 20 percent of Australand Trust. Um, Stocklands likely to grow earnings somewhere around 6 percent at a dividend yield of around 6.5 percent. Uh, we're buyers of it again on this recent pullback at 370 and selling calls up at around the 410 level, driving about 12% cash flow on an annualised basis out of uh, out of Stockland. The other property play that we like is GPT. We've been buyers of this at lower levels. We've sold the calls up at around 370. We got good money for those, effectively giving us an exit price up here around 390. We're looking for GPT to largely consolidate and move sideways. Uh, for new money becoming available, still happy to buy the stock at around this 350 level, sell the covered calls up at around 370, collect the upcoming dividend, again complementing that yield from sort of 5.5% up to around 10 to 12% and allowing for some capital growth. GPT should grow earnings somewhere around 5% and the company's buying back share, buying back their shares which makes it even more compelling. Within the resource space, here here's our preference, BHP. I spent a bit of time last week talking about obviously the sell-off we've seen in iron ore from 140 a tonne back down to 110. Iron ore is starting to stabilise a little bit short term. The market's getting optimistic that the <coughs> Chinese economy may require further stimulus measures. I think that's probably, if they do, it's certainly not, not going to be anything that I think creates excessive resource demand beyond what the market's already priced in. So at around sort of this $337, we take the opportunity still to sell covered calls up at around $39. I think BHP, in line with our view, our macro view on both the domestic economy and the US economy where we're likely to see consolidation and maybe a pick up in the back half of the year. I think that flows through to the resources, probably not doing much more than putting on another 5% or so from where they are at the moment. So BHP, if you look at spot uh, prices for iron ore, put that into the model. Uh, BHP's gone from uh, expecting 10% earnings growth in the 12 months ahead to having reasonably flat numbers over the next 12 months and with BHP trading somewhere 
in the order of sort of three and a half percent dividend yield on about 12 times forward earnings. I think that represents reasonably fair value. But in saying that, I think the company is likely to buy back shares or issue, provide special dividends in the second half of this year. That underpins any downside risk. So I think, you know, given that it's also not a single commodity in that over 30 percent of BHP's portfolio now nearing 40 percent is from the energy side of things, that it provides a little bit more of a defensive asset mix than, say, Rio or Fortescue. So our preference is exposure to BHP and selling calls up around that $39 level again, taking sort of what's a 3.5% dividend yield and driving it up to around 10 to 12% cash flow and providing for some upside potential. Woodside Petroleum trading on around a 6% dividend yield at these levels. I don't see it doing too much short term, but our strategy here has been again owning this. We see it as reasonably defensive on the downside. We've been selling calls up around the $39, $40 level, again driving that cash flow up to in excess of 12% in the case of Woodside Petroleum. Now let's have a quick look at a couple of the defensive names that we've positioned around Woolworths. We recently collected the uh, dividend in Woolworths. Um, I think up here at these levels the stock's getting down to about a 3.8% dividend yield, trading about 17, 18 times earnings. It's expensive. I would be surprised to see Woolworths, you know, push substantially higher and trade up to sort of $37, $38. That would put the stock back down on a low 3% dividend yield. Uh, and I think probably we're likely to see it run into some resistance. Um, and on any pullback, I think at around this 35 50 level, the stock becomes a good buying opportunity, but again, only if that's complemented with selling the covered call. West Farmers, on the other hand, has had a reasonable pullback. I think it's sitting back at an area which uh, will provide value, albeit again, to put that in context, it's trading at about 19 times forward earnings and on a 4% dividend yield. Um, so on a 4.5% dividend yield, I should say. Uh, from a valuation standpoint, the stock's about 19 times current earnings and about 17 times next year's earnings. Um, so owning it at these levels, we have been buyers of it in the past on pullback to around $41. We have been selling the $44 calls. We got good premium for that, uh, which is uh, we received around a dollar, dollar fifty for that. So on an annualised basis, that adds almost another three dollars of income on a on a 12-month basis to the West Farmers trade and again taking that from sort of a 4.5% dividend yield up to around 12-13% cash flow and allowing for some capital growth from $41 back up to $44. So I continue to think West Farmers make sense for portfolios at these levels. Telstra, we've been buyers of this on this recent pullback here at $5. I think as we move in towards the August dividend period, the stock will trade back up to $5.25. We take that opportunity to sell the covered calls, drive the current dividend yield of sort of around 5.5% up to around 10 to 12% and allow for some capital growth. So we're buyers of Telstra at these levels. Um, the other defensive name that we've been active in is Transurban. We're buyers of this at lower levels around this 675 level. Up here at around 725 we started selling covered calls. Puts the stock on just over a 4% dividend yield pays its dividend uh, in June and we'll look to collect that. Um, within the property plays, we've looked at sort of some of the property development with Len Lease and Stocklands being beneficiaries of the development side of the cycle, but within the actual property trust and Westfield Retail and WDC we continue to like. So this trades on a 6% dividend yield and we see it really consolidating. So if we can complement owning this asset with selling the covered calls and driving that 6% dividend yield up to sort of 10 or 12%, I think that makes sense as well. Likewise across WDC, we've got the pending um, demerger of some of the Australian property assets from WDC across to Westfield Retail, which we'll continue to report on in uh, the weeks or probably really into middle May before we get uh, some further announcements out around that. And a theme that we continue to like in portfolios is some of these Aussie dollar exposure uh, plays. So if the Aussie dollar was to move back down, these names are likely to 
be a beneficiary of that being Brambles and Amcor. So Brambles at this level, the stock trades on about a 3.5% dividend yield uh, and about 16 times forward earnings and that's allowing for about 8% earnings growth. So even at this level here we're comfortable continuing to buy Brambles but certainly complementing it with a covered call up at around $10, uh, collecting the dividend, collecting the call premium, driving 10% plus cash flow out of Brambles and likewise here with Amcor. The stock's expensive in that it's trading at about um, trading at about 16 times current earnings um, with the pullback that it's had from sort of $11 when it pulled back down to 1020 it started, we were buyers of it again here at this 1020 level pushing back up towards 1050 at that price point the yield on the stocks uh, getting down to around four and a half percent on current numbers about five percent on forward earnings growth uh, but the stock could probably support a trade back up to around $11 but not too much beyond that so we've been buyers of it at this level and just now starting to look to sell the covered calls but continue to like Amcor and then finally just a couple of uh, value plays where I see probably a good mix of earnings growth potential and reasonably defensive from a downside perspective AZJ here at around $5.10 uh, we're buyers of it. We're selling sort of the 525 or 550 covered call over AZJ. I think over the course of this year, the stock probably in the back half of the year could push back up to sort of 535, 40. Um, and then finally, to conclude today's recording, the ASX. So we've been buyers of this on on the pullback here at around this $36 level. I think as it trades back up to around $37, we sell the covered calls up at around $37.50 to $38. Uh, we collect the upcoming dividend in August. Uh, the company delivered above uh, average uh, earnings growth in the first half of 2014 and I think sort of given our recovery outlook on a two to three year uh, basis for the ongoing recovery in the global economy. The prospect of the ASX being subject to further uh, corporate takeover announcements in, in the in the, in the years ahead, again, will underpin ASX, I think, from a downside risk perspective, and it makes sense to, if you can be driving 10 or 12% cash flow out of these names that provide lower volatility on the downside, um, I think what that achieves for an overall portfolio is you're able to sort of keep um, matching the upside advancements of the market, but all the whilst providing you know lower volatility in the portfolio should any pullback in equity markets occur and at a macro level in previous weeks we've looked at what would be the downside risk to equity markets and it's roughly 10 percent if the US uh, economy doesn't continue to grow and therefore that 8 to 10 percent of earnings growth that's priced into S&P 500 companies was backed out um, you know that's where that downside risk comes to. So I think from an asset allocation standpoint if we can have names in portfolios that are probably not going to see that same level of uh, downside um, risk and in the process drive 10 to 12 percent cash flow and allow for capital growth if the market was to continue to advance I think that starts to sort of build the picture of where our model portfolio sits. Uh, thank you for listening in to today's recording. If you'd like to know more information about the Investor Signals uh, premium account service, uh, please contact us using the information on screen.